So, you know, we talked about for, I don't know, as you know, when patient comes in, um, so that, like that first patient um, that I'd show the case study, um, so I'd show the, some of the endocrine labs and the bottom line was, you know, those labs are fine. It's important that all these patients get endocrine uh, labs and endocrine workup. And the first thing you want to know is, is it a functional adenoma or is it not? And in general, I would kind of tell patients that there's three buckets um, that I classify them into. And the reason I say that is out of the functional adenoma category, prolactinomas, which is a type of functional adenoma is in its own category to an extent, um, because it's the one that um, does well in terms of responding to medical, medical treatment. And, and as of right now, medical therapy is the first line for uh, treatment of that. And we'll get into some of, some of the nuances of that you know, shortly. Um, but once you send the lab, if it turns out to be a non-functioning adenoma, meaning it's not secreting excess hormone, um, then you have to look at the rest of the hormone. Is there anything that's low that's the opposite of excess, right? And um, that has to be replaced. Um, this is why like treating these patients is, is multidisciplinary. So endocrinology, uh, neurosurgery, ENT, um, and neuro-ophthalmologists, because um, these patients can have visual field deficits. Um, and surgery for non-functional adenomas is reserved for documented growth or if a patient is having clear evidence of vision loss, both subjective and objective um, on a formal visual field exam. Um, and in some cases, this is what we call like a soft, soft uh, uh, indication. If say it, you know, there's no growth, you find this incidentally, there's no growth, there's no vision loss in, in visual field um, exam, but there is evidence of severe optic pathway compression Right, so then you can then you fall into that gray zone. But uh, most, I think, most of us would, would offer them surgery because those patients is it's only a matter of time before they develop visual loss and they're at risk for pituitary apoplexy. Um, so from a workup perspective, we talked about the um, the full endocrine panel, the need for formal visual field exam, um, and it's all, it's important to do an MRI pituitary protocol. Not just you know when this is captured incidentally in the MRI brain. Um, those slices are not thin enough, they're not zoomed in enough in the pituitary gland, and typically they don't have dynamic uh, pituitary sequences in there. So you definitely need an MRI pituitary protocol with and without contrast. Um, and you can actually do, um, we have a protocol for without contrast in patients who say are pregnant um, or they have contrast allergy or you know, for whatever reason that essentially includes uh, flare sequences and T2 sequences. Uh, but these surgeries can be done microscopically or um, endoscopically. There's been multiple research that has looked at is one better than the other, um, as it, most as it relates to non-functional adenomas, which are really the, the, um, the types of tumors that were included in, in most of these studies. Um, but in general, after surgery, the average hospital stays anywhere from one to three days. Um, you have the outliers, right? Probably one day is more of an outlier. I think on average, more like two to three days, to be quite honest. Um, but then you have the, the you know, the um, other side of the bell curve where people end up being in the hospital for longer, for whatever reason, um, five days, maybe they had a persistent CSF leak and, and, and or um, diabetes insipidus, and we're not quite sure if it's gonna be temporary or uh, permanent. Um, I put this study here because I think it's important. Like I said, there's been many studies that have looked at this, um, but this one is a good one. It was essentially organized by neurosurgeons, four neurosurgeons. Um, and the purpose of this study was to look at the question of is microscopic better than endoscopic slash is there a difference in the outcome of these patients? So it, it involved uh, seven pituitary centers. There are particular criteria that you have to meet to be called a pituitary center. Um, that's beyond the scope of this, but 15 surgeons, um, there was a certain number of uh, cases that the surgeons have to do a year, I think greater than 120 pituitary cases. So it had to be at high level uh, centers. Um, and like I said, most of these, uh, essentially all of them were non-functioning macroadenomas. And I point that out because as we kind of come down to the bottom line of this, it's important to know that um, this is not to be, you can't extrapolate this to functional macroadenomas by any means. And this was non-randomized. Um, so essentially those surgeons, you know, some surgeons have preferences, they prefer microscopic, some surgeons have preferences, they prefer endoscopic. Uh, more old school surgeons, um, uh, you know, longer practice tend to be the ones doing it microscopically. Um, and then the younger guys tend to do it endoscopically. Um, gross surgery section was achieved uh, essentially similar between both groups. Uh, the volumetric extent of resection, the length of stay, death, um, unplanned admission, readmission rates were essentially similar. Uh, new hormone deficiency was present at six months um, in 28% of microscopic versus lower in the endoscopic group, which was, that was 
statistically significant. And the idea being that with the endoscope, you know, the camera is inside the nose, you can easily decipher between gland, what's left of the gland and, and tumor and kind of separate that out um, versus with the microscopic, some of it is blinded. Uh, the microscopic had significantly shorter duration than the endoscopic. Um, and the reason for that is most of the microscopic cases, you know, it, ENT is not involved. Um, so it's just one neurosurgeon, the, you know, the, all the team in the room is well-versed. There's less equipment that needs to be set up versus with the endoscopic, there's a lot that goes into, um, into those cases and over time being efficient with it, which another reason goes back into this has to be like the, the, the criteria for these centers have to be centers that do these routinely. Um, and, and we talked about the microscopic surgeons were more, more experienced. Um, and then they essentially supported the transition to endoscopic approach um, when performed by profession surgeons, although both microscopic and endoscopic yield overall acceptable surgical outcomes. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.